Welcome to the Financial Freedom Podcast with your host, Lorna Poole, sharing the secrets to creating wealth, investing, and that all-important money mindset. To find out more and accelerate your journey to financial freedom, head on over to www.lornapool.com to get started. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Financial Freedom Podcast. You want to invest on your, your portfolio. You want it to be making you money. How about buying a business for investing? Well, my guest expert today is David Barnett, and he's a tr- third-time best-selling author, consultant, and business coach who has been working with small business owners for over 20 years. Over the past 10 years, he's been helping people to buy and sell businesses. David works directly with clients and proceeds online education products to teach aspects of small business purchase and sales transactions. David, great to have you here. Hi, Lorna. Thanks for inviting me on today. Why should we be considering small businesses or local businesses? As as part of a portfolio? Is that your question? Yeah, part of the portfolio or part of another, you know, stream of income. Sure. Um, Well, I think that the first question you have to answer for yourself is what kind of life do you want to build? Because most people who go out into the world to buy a small or medium-sized business, in addition to making an investment, they're also getting a job. Because a lot of the times when people buy a small business, they end up being the manager. Yeah, I well believe it. Yeah. (laughs) So, so It's more than just a numbers question. And what's interesting is that when small businesses are presented for sale, the most typical cash flow figure that we see is what's called seller's discretionary earnings or seller's cash flow. There are a couple of different ways that it's described. But essentially, it is the amount of money that is available to a full-time owner operator. So if you look at that business and you say, wow, this business has a cash flow of $100,000 and it only costs, you know, $250,000. That's a 40% rate of return. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's not because in order to get that money, you got to work full time. Yeah. And so that's one of the, the common traps that people fall into when they're looking at a business that's for sale is they forget about or they undervalue the value of their labor. So in reality, the return on that investment, first thing you'd have to do is is reduce that cash flow by a fair market salary that you should earn as the manager of that business because that's what you'll be earning with your labor. And then if there's anything left beyond that, that's the true investment income of the business. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And, and so, I can see how people would overlook that. <laughs> people get it. People get excited. The, the um, small businesses are risky. And as a result of that, they sell for fairly low valuation multiples. Businesses are traditionally sold as a multiple of cash flow. And we will, when we look at bigger businesses, like if you talk with a stock market guy, they'll often be talking about how a business might be trading for 11 times forecasted EBITDA. Mm-hmm. Well, in, in that statement, when he's talking about a publicly traded stock, he's talking about, number one, a different cash flow level. So EBITDA, all the managers are paid at that level, right? Mm-hmm. And the other big difference between a publicly traded stock and a local small business is something we call liquidity risk. And so every day that the stock market is open, you can buy and sell shares in those entity, in those companies. Mm -hmm. But if you buy a small business and you run it for a year and decide you don't like it, it could take you literally years to sell it again. Mm -hmm. So we call that liquidity risk. It's the risk of not being able to turn your asset back into cash. And so that's why whenever someone's talking to me about buying a business as part of an investment portfolio, I really try to get into some questions about how they see their life and what their their personal goals are for lifestyle. Because even if you buy a business then you're able to hire someone else to run it for you, you still always get sucked in. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do because you you um 
you need you want it to work and so i think sometimes it's gonna sound really bad um i think when you buy a business or anything that you're involved in maybe they won't do as good a job as you so you you need to be involved or you know sort of overlook what's going on yeah 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 well it's not just that but you know when you own a small business, you own every hat of the the C level suite. You know all yeah. the big decisions are yours. Yeah. And let's let's take a really simple example. You know a retail store. Let's say you find somebody who can manage it for you. Mm-hmm. Well, that manager may be ordering goods and making sure that staff show up on time and creating schedules and handling the bank deposits and everything that's normal in the day to day. But if it comes time to make a decision like will we move the shop or will we invest in new decor or new, you know, shelving or something like this, you're probably not going to leave that in the hands of the manager. No. And so there's a certain level of decision that will always end up coming back to you. And, and I always compare small local businesses with the chain shops. So you you could have a a little family owned corner store and you can also have a big company that owns say a, a string of gas stations and you look at those two businesses and they, they look kind of the same from the outside. But what you don't see in the chain of gas stations is that while each store has a manager, there's also higher levels of management above that. So there's somebody with a skill of overseeing store managers, right? Mm-hmm. And then probably somebody above them with the skill of making long-term decisions for deploying capital or reinvesting or something mm-hmm. like that. And so even if you can buy that business that is really as hands off as you think you can get, you're still going to end up spending time and being caught up in the business to some degree. Now I've seen people be very happy in a regular career while owning some kind of business on the side, like a laundromat or maybe some investment property or something like this or a campground or something that they manage through part of the year. Um, But it means that they work a lot for some part of the year. And I'm just, I just don't want to create the impression out there that it's easy to go and buy a business and have it run on its own. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that's what I'm really enjoying about this conversation because um, I think we can hear these sort of, uh, what's the word? Um, shiny objects. But like <laughs> there's a reality behind it all. And, you know, I, I, you know, as you as you started this conversation, it's what life do you want to build? Some people would thrive off that. Other people would absolutely hate it and it would not suit them. Mm. So how did you, um, tell us a little bit about your story. So how did you uh, get into this or, you know, yeah, sure. you're involved in buying and selling all the time. So you, you're, you know what you're at. Yeah. So, I, you know, I got started, um, actually I owned a, a debt brokerage for small and medium sized businesses. So people would come to me, uh, typically when they've been told no by a banker, they would come over to my shop and I, and they, I would help them lease equipment or borrow from an alternative lender, uh, or do something called factoring, which is when a business has receivables from their customers they can sell them to a third party to get cash more quickly. Mm -hmm. So I was helping people with all these different kinds of financings. And I kept getting approached by people who were looking for money to buy existing businesses. And what I noticed about these deals is that they were very often poorly put together. And what I came to learn is that there's an entire profession out there called business broker or over in the UK, I think they call them business transfer agents. Mm-hmm. And so you might've heard that term more often. Um, and so their whole specialization is in helping people buy and sell businesses. And it was really lacking in my marketplace. So when we, and, and other people were trying to do it like real estate agents or accountants or attorneys, and, and they didn't know how to do it properly. Things mm-hmm. just were getting messed up. So when the financial crisis came in 2008, Um, over half of the different companies I was using as a source of credit for my customers, they went under in that crisis. And I knew that I had to make a change. And so I actually signed on with a large international business broker franchise chain. And I chose them because they gave me access to training. Mm -hmm. And over a two and a half year period, I did 
a bunch of courses and then had to go and write a big exam akin to someone getting some sort of insurance or mutual fund license, you know? So Mm -hmm. I wrote the exam and that's when I became certified to help people buy and sell businesses. And I ran my brokerage for three years and I sold 36 businesses for other people in that time. And business brokerage is a terrible business to be in. (laughs) I don't recommend it to anyone. And here, and here's why Lorna, um, you, have to convince someone that you're the person to sell their business. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that takes two years. Yeah. And then they sign on with you and you go through the work of preparing everything and putting paperwork together and creating a presentation package for potential buyers. Um, And then it can take up to three years to sell one if you can sell it. And so what was happening with me is I was spending a huge amount of time working with these clients and then I would get paid very infrequently or deals would get delayed and things like this. And it was a very uneven cash flow. Yeah. And at the end of 2011, I got out of the industry. Um, I actually went and took a position with a bank. And I live, uh, I live in Atlantic Canada. So we have you know people that are spread out quite a distance. So I spent a lot of time in my car driving from one city to the next. And my phone kept ringing. And it was people who either met me when I had my office opened or they were people who had been given my name and they were looking for help to buy or sell a business. And initially I just told people, you know, I, I don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And one day this guy named Bob called me and Bob had come in and met me when I had my office open. And he said, Dave, I've, I've found this business. I think it's ideal for me. I've been to my accountant and my lawyer. They both tell me what kind of deal I need to get, but neither seems to be able to advise me on how to move through this process. Mm -hmm. and and negotiate and and really talk to the other party. And I said, Bob, I I don't know what to say. I don't do it anymore. I would have to work as some kind of consultant and I have a full-time job. And he he just said, David, what's your address? I'll come over Saturday morning. And and that was the beginning of a little side hustle consulting position that I started to build for myself. And over the course of two years, um, it began to generate almost as much money for me as my salary at the bank. And eventually I left the bank. And for the past four years, this is all I've been doing is helping people on a consulting. I call it myself a process coach because I help people through the process of a, an acquisition or, or the sale of a business. Mm-hmm. I do consulting work too, because I actually do work for the clients that they're not able to do. So If I'm working with a seller, I'll do the evaluation on the business and prepare the package and then coach them through their interactions with potential buyers. Yeah, interesting. Um, You know, um, and I love the way you've moved to helping them with the process. So you're not involved, as you explained earlier, when you had your office, you know, buying that you know the getting that business ready to sell and and so forth there's a lot in that and as you say years to Mm. to make it work it's 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 made a huge change in my life because now um basically as i work with people they pay me for what i do and then when they're successful in their transaction there's no commission because i don't have an agency role um with with either party so i I really do have a business model that's much more like an accountant or, or a lawyer would have where you go to them and they give you advice or help you with a certain problem and, they, and then you pay them. So it's worked out well for me. And, and the other interesting thing that I've discovered over the, over the years is that people who are trying to buy a business really appreciate what I do. As you can imagine, a broker who's paid on commission, um, they really have a vested interest in that person buying the business uh, and so it would be like going to a realty agent and asking them what kind of, you know, accommodation you should have. They're probably going to tell you to buy a house rather than rent an apartment. Yeah. Right. And so uh, a lot of the times I'll look at a deal with someone and I'll show them why the deal doesn't work and why it would be dangerous for them. One of, uh, one of the ways that I promote myself is with my YouTube channel. So I put on a new video every week. And some of the saddest uh, email messages I ever get are from people who say that they wish they had found my channel before. And usually it means that they've made some kind of poor investment and now um, they've either lost money or they've locked themselves into a position where 
they can't sell the business you know, oftentimes for years until they've paid down debts or, or, or achieve something else in order to be able to move on. And let's, let's just talk about that. If someone's looking to buy a business with the goal to resell, you know, I know you, you shared in the beginning about uh, the return rate, but what are the nitty gritty you need to be looking at to say that this business, and I know it's high risk and all that, to say that this business will have a good turnaround? So the, the, the one thing to realize is that because small businesses sell for relatively low multiples, yep. nobody is interested in selling them. Yeah. Nobody wants to sell a good business. Lots of people yeah. want to sell a bad business. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I would say that's very true. Yes, absolutely. No, easy peasy, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so in order to buy a good business, what you need is you need a seller who's developed some sort of personal motivation that means that they can no longer operate the business. Yeah. And so typically it's burnout and fatigue, divorce, poor health, the need to relocate, or retirement. These are the things that that move someone into a position where they just can't run it anymore. Yeah. And once you get that business, because of the low multiples that they are often valued at, it really doesn't make sense to sell. So mm-hmm. I always tell people then the notion of flipping businesses, mm-hmm. like you might flip a house, mm-hmm. it, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because if you buy a good business and it's making good earnings for you, and you have no reason personally to sell it, you shouldn't. You should just keep it and enjoy those profits. What I always tell my students to look for is look for a business that has problems and is still making profits, especially problems that you know how to address because that's where you're going to find the real diamond in the rough because you're going to buy it. Even if you don't address the problems, you're going to make money. And then if you apply your knowledge to make improvements, then you're going to grow those profits. The value of the business will increase, but most importantly, you're going to enjoy those increased profits while you're the owner. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the way you shared about problems, but still making profit. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, some, some examples that I see quite regularly are business owners who are in later stages of life And maybe they have a more manual process in some of their documentation or paperwork. Mm -hmm. And someone could come in there and apply some new technology. Like automate it more or something? Yeah, exactly. Streamline things, make things more automated, you know, introduce new services to customers, you know, ordering via an app or something like this and increase the, the turnover and the profits of the business while making probably the newer generation of customers happier because they're being served in ways that they prefer. And what about, um, you know, different types like technology or, um, as you said, retail, you know, is there trends? You know. Or is a good business just a good business no matter what? Every business out there is on the path to obsolescence. Yeah, it will be, yeah. If you want, if you want to have the the sour look at it, and that's why I often tell people that there's a big difference between a business and a company or a corporation or whatever structure you have. And I like to use the example of the Hudson's Bay Company. And so the Hudson's Bay Company was set up 400 years ago. You know, when uh, Canada was being colonized, and and they traded with the locals to get furs and things like this. Mm-hmm. And they didn't spend 400 years doing that. Mm-hmm. They eventually became a retail store and then they had, you know, big department stores and, and all kinds of things. So the company evolved its business as the times changed, they got into new and different things. And so what I like to see is I like to see a business that serves things that people either really need or really want. And, and, and here's why. And, and, and that can't be done by robots. All right. So, so think about this, you know, right now you probably can't have a robot change, you know, the tires on your car. Maybe someday you will, but right now you can't. Right. So something like a tire shop to me is something that's interesting because everyone wears out the tires on their cars and they're going to need new tires. Right. So there's always going to be a need at the other end of the scale are the wants. So, 
I know people who will turn off every light in their house to save every dollar they can to buy, you know, their next extreme mountain bike because they really want, (laughs) you know, they really, really, really want that mountain bike. Yeah. Right. So, so to me, if you're in one of those kinds of businesses, then you are going to be able to develop relationships with clients, especially clients that keep coming back. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I rarely go somewhere new for the tires on my car because the place I go gives me good service and good pricing and I'm happy. So I become a loyal client to of that place and I keep coming back. And the same thing with, you know, the guy who sells those mountain bikes, he can set himself out as an expert and develop a clientele who's going to be loyal to him. Yeah. And I, I love the way you bring back, it always comes back to those business fundamentals of, you know, what, what does the customer need, you know, sell them what they want. And as you say, reoccurring clients, all that stuff, um, it's it's massive for a business success and success and I love the way you shared about the Hudson Bay, how a business has to evolve with mm-hmm. you know what goes on over time or they they don't last absolutely. David, we've had an amazing conversation. For anyone listening to this, they're interested in um, you know buying a business with the intention to sell at some point or keep it and have it make an income. Um, what would you say to them? Um, I would say that you need to develop yourself to have the skills to be able to understand what's going on in a business. So understanding financial statements and knowing how you're going to create systems so that you can manage the business. Otherwise, you're going to have to be there all the time. And we've all met business owners like that. They don't get to go on vacation and they work crazy number of hours And that's definitely not the place you want to be. And when I gave you the reasons why people sell businesses, the number one reason I gave you was burnout and fatigue. And that is the most common reason. And it's people who don't get properly organized. Yeah, you see it over and over again. And I love the way you share that about, you know, what's their personal motivation. I mean, people use, you know, when I, when you're saying this, I was thinking back, oh yeah, yeah, you know, divorce, relocation, burnout, like it's, it's very common. Yeah, absolutely. David, thank you. This has been amazing. How do we get in touch with you? How do we find out more about you? Sure. Um, my website for my blog is davidcbarnett.com. And from there, I've got other websites that talk specifically about buying or selling businesses. And there's links to YouTube and all that kind of thing. And I think, Lorna, I gave you a special uh, download link for yes. one of my books. It's a very popular book. It's called 21 Stupid Things That People Do When Trying to Buy a Business. So that tip I started with about understanding the value of your labor that's just one of those things that's in that ebook. And that's a, that's a free download that people are welcome to enjoy. Thank you, David. And thank you for being here. This has been amazing. Oh, it's been a great time. Thanks for having me, Lorna. Hey, everyone. Remember to join us in the Private Financial Freedom Podcast Facebook group with me, your host, Lorna Poole. This is a safe haven of like-minded, wealth-getting go-getters who, like you, are on their journey to creating financial freedom in their life. This is where you and I can get intimate. Give, I can give you the support and guides to go from where you are now to where you want to be, developing your wealth mindset and creating your financial freedom life. Join at www.facebook.com slash groups, the financial freedom podcast. You will see the links to this on the website. It's in the show notes. And, or type it into the Facebook group. All you have to type in is Financial Freedom Podcast and you will see us there. Look forward to seeing you in the group. Take care. Thank you for joining us on the Financial Freedom Podcast to creating wealth, investing and developing your money mindset. To get started today on your journey, head on over to www.lornapool.com and grab your free course five steps to breaking free from your poverty mindset and accelerating your journey to financial freedom. See you there.